Afternoon guys. <laughs> it is afternoon. Uh, glad to see you again. Dr. Ken Arbor here. <laughs> uh, today we're on part D of uh, precautions taken once you get to your stand site. And uh, we're just still talking about two ways of doing it. One uh, sitting in a tree and the other one sitting on the ground on a stool. And so we'll cover both of those. We got most of the preliminaries out of the way, but there's a couple I thought of that I want to talk about just a little bit before we get to that. One of them is uh, rattling. You know, when uh, when you're rattling, which is still, you know, you can still call deer now and then using rattling antlers. These are sheds. and. Uh, they're different sizes, which is common. You usually only find one antler of a deer where at when they're shedding in one place and the next the other one might be a hundred yards away and you might not find it. I've got a place, uh, where, a couple places where I can find antlers every year, every spring, early spring, right after snowfall or snow melt is my favorite time and, and uh, you can find antlers before the mice and squirrels and, and uh, uh, other animals who like to chew on uh, deer antlers, you find them. Uh, a good time to go. They're still looking pretty good. Uh, but anyway, my favorite ant uh, rattling antlers are real antlers. And that's a good reason for going out and looking for sheds and finding some that you can use. And, uh, but the point of, I have here is that when you're using them and you start making sounds like a couple deer paddling like that, there might be a buck over here and a buck over there and they hear that and they're like kids in a playground when the fight starts, they all run over there to see it happening. And the uh, first time I ever used rattling antlers, I, I took this over to a local airport it had a lot of trees around one end and it was known for having being home to quite a number of deer. I actually had, within all oh, about 15 minutes, seven different bucks within sight rattling. They probably never heard a humans doing that before and they were all anxious. Well, I've never seen anything like that since then. All I've ever seen is one buck at a time. And not that, all that often. My son John likes to use rattling antlers uh, fairly often and he he manages to attract ducks with bucks with these antlers every now and then so it's still a worthwhile thing but when you're doing that uh, the deer are looking right toward where you are and it's terribly important when you're using rattling antlers to have good cover now we talked about all kinds of different kinds of cover in our in our three previous talks here about uh, precautions well, it's especially important when you're using rattling antlers because that motion is something they're really going to be keying on. So same with if you're using a grunt call. You should never be using a grunt call a lot at any one stand site. Uh, if I'm going to use a grunt call, maybe once I'll, I'll do one grunt, sometimes two, no more often than once in a half hour. That's the most I'll, I'll make a grunt. And there again, you're making a motion. And when you make that sound, they're going to be looking right at you. And they might be a lot closer than you think. So there again, you need cover. I've got another gizmo on my neck here. It's kind of a crazy thing. I need to buy another one. And I, I haven't seen one. I hope I see one again soon. This is called a cough must muffler. Uh, cold air will sometimes tickle my throat when I'm out there sitting in the tree stand. I got a cough coming on and just muffling my mouth with my gloves or with my hands with gloves on my throat isn't enough. The cough will still be quite loud. But you can look at it. I'll, I'll do a little cough <coughs> and I'll do the same thing here. <coughs> See that? <laughs> that's pretty effective and that's better than eat it than putting a cough drop in your mouth, and those things usually have a lot of strange odor to them, which might be a little bit alarming to any deer that are downwind of you. A cough muffler. 
I hope whoever created this thing is still putting them out there because probably what I'm saying right now is going to make this a popular item in the future for deer hunters. That's a really good thing to have. At least I believe so because I tend to cough out there in, in, uh, while I'm stand hunting. So anyway, all these extra motions that you're going to use when you're out there have to be covered. And I, and I wanted to make it make sure you know this is really important, especially if you're going to be moving around doing these other things while you're sitting in the, in the, your tree stand or at the ground level. Here's another thing. I, last time I put on a, a uh, head net with a, with a hole in front, which usually works really good, but let's say you're out there and the sun is coming up and it's going to be shining in your direction and you wear glasses, like I do. I got another head net that I use that has no hole in it. And it's a good head net. Um, cap on top, and you can see right through it. You can aim with your rifle and the scope just fine without any problem. You can use it with a bow. With a bow, I like to add a loose rubber band around the bottom part here because you know, you come to a full draw here, you got your knuckle of your thumb against the back part of your jaw like that. If that thing is waving around out here in a little breeze and the string catches that, it's going to be pretty exciting. <laughs> you know, it's going to rip that thing right off your face. <laughs> so, anyway, you want it that tight against the side of your face where uh, uh, the bow string is going to pass. So, keep that in mind. But well, with this on, the sun can shine on my head. I, I try often, I think about that, especially when bear hunting, and you have a chance to do that because you know exactly where the bear is going to be when you, when you fire at him. That I never want to be facing that bear with the sun shining at me. I want to be with the sun behind me if it's possible. Most often that means, uh, you know, about 100% of the bears I've ever shot were taken during the last hour of the day, the sun setting in the west. And so I wanted to be facing east, or at least in that general direction, northeast or southeast, in my stand. And then my bait site, my positioning bait is out in front of me here. If you never heard of positioning bait, uh, that's something you really want to know about. You have to check on my bear hunting books and other and videos to find out more about them. But it's good to have a, a head net like this. And if you only had one, you can even use it like this, you know, you can, if you want to uh, use it like it's got a hole in it, you can turn it so that uh, you've got a hole in front like that, you can have it out in front of you like that, and there's, there's your hole. And so one like this can be used in a lot of ways. but. Uh, it's good, to, even if you don't wear glasses, to have a head net like that because the sun shining on your face, you want it'd be nice to have complete coverage then. So, anyway, uh, that was one thing. Now, last time we were we got we talked about uh, loading your rifle and uh, silently, and so I've got a, one of my grandson's rifle. Actually, I gave this to him. I went to a banquet one time and won this Model 94 Winchester on a five cent ticket. <laughs> How lucky can you be? And then later on, I even had, it was drilled and tapped for scope mounts. So I put a scope on it and this has side ejection so it doesn't hit the scope when the bullet comes out. Sort of a, a new fangled 94. <laughs> But uh, it's a nice little gun. I love it. You know, it's a nice gun. And my, and my, I, you know, it was a good one for a kid to start, a young kid, you know, a lighter rifle, easy to use. It doesn't have the great accuracy of a rifle like my, it was the Model 77 uh, Ruger uh, chamber for 7 millimeter Magnum. That's an extremely accurate rifle. But uh, it's a good deer gun and, uh, you know, from 50 to 100 yards, this is a very fine gun, a 30-30. Uh, they're faster moving nowadays, and back when I was a kid and just starting out, these things 
uh, have better trajectory and more killing power over a longer range. And so the 30 theory is still pretty good for cartridge. Now, loading a rifle. Silent. I've got an empty shell here, casing I'm going to use. But, you know, if you got up in your tree stand and you have your magazine all filled, or like on my 7 millimeter underneath this section of the gun, filled with cartridges and the bullets in there. And all you have to do normally to load your gun is open it all the way like that. You hear that click? And the shell pops up and is pointed, that comes up from the magazine, is pointed toward the chamber so that when you close it, it goes in. That shell goes into the, into the chamber. But if you did all that, that click can be kind of ruinous to hunting especially if it's the big buck he wants to take is right over there about 40, 50 yards away. He's going to hear that. There's no way he's not going to hear that. His hearing is excellent. And so what I usually do, I go, go to the woods with my chamber or my magazine loaded with bullets. But instead of using one of those to, to fill the chamber after I get it up into the, my tree stem, I will carefully open, open the bolt or in this case, move the lever to forward to open the, uh, the top of the, the, this loading chamber up, and get it back about three quarters of the way, two thirds, three quarters of the way. And then take a bullet from my pocket, carried there just for that purpose, and hand load it into the chamber. There it's in there, not all the way. And then ease that bolt forward like that. And now it's all the way in there with little or no distinct noise. And then it's cocked and ready to fire if it's a Model 94 like this. Now, you're loaded. Uh, you got a live round in the chamber, but it's ready to fire. The hammer's all the way back. That's typical for uh, lever action. And so you got to ease that forward. You, by doing that, you, you pull back on the hammer all the way then the trigger, and then ease it forward slowly, and then it'll stop at the half cock position. But now you're loaded, and it won't fire, everything's ready to go. So that's how you put uh, a, how you load up your gun in, uh, in your tree stand silently. With a bolt action, you just open it like you normally open it, and come back about two thirds to three quarters of the way back, same way hand load a cartridge into the chamber, then move the bolt back carefully and lock it. And uh, then down, put your safety on. Uh, in, in the case of my rifle, it's got to come back. And you know, my rifle's the Model 77 Ruger and it's got this tang on the back here on the pistol grip. And if I just pull it back with my thumb, on one thumb like this, it'll click. Uh, if I'm in, if I got a deer out in front of me and I push it forward to the off position so the gun will fire with one thumb, it'll click. So when I'm in my stand, I always sit with my gun like this across my lap. So, oh gee, here comes a buck and he's getting close to where, oh yeah, I got to get ready. I got to get this into the off position, this, this tank. And I do it by using both thumbs one on both sides of the tank, and I move them forward together slowly, and if I do that, get all the way to the off position, I can do it without it making any sound at all. Now, I don't know what kind of a safety you got. Maybe you got a cross bolt. Maybe a cross bolt, you need two fingers too to move that from one side to the other without it clicking and making noise. But the worst thing at this point here, with that big buck out in front of you, is a click. <laughs> of your safety being moved from from off to on or off or on to off either direction. So learn how to do that safely. Practice that at home over and over again. New cup. Dad, if you got a kid and he gave him a rifle like this, sit down in the evening and teach him how to do that and have him do it over and over again until he said, Dad, I can do it without making any noise and have him demonstrate it to you. So same thing with loading, using an empty cartridge, you can do that over and over again until you can do that. 
There'll be a little bit of sound, but it won't be very much. And but to learn to do that is so important. I mean, everything else that you've done up to this point, all the precautions you've taken, when that buck is out there in front of you, whether you realize he's there or not. Sometimes it happens, oh gee, there's this nice six pointer. I wonder if I should take that. I think I'll take that. And if it goes click, and all of a sudden, geez, here's a great big buck over on the side, bounding away, snorting. That happens. It'll, it happens to every buck hunter many times in a lifetime. So you got to be able to do that without making uh, sounds like that. So learn that. That's a very important. That's an important part. And learn it at home. Don't learn it in the woods. Do it at home. Okay? All right. Now, with all that out of the way, now let's get to be a buck hunter. Yeah. We're finally seated on our stool on the ground or on a tree stand, and we're sitting there, and it's all quiet, and uh, now it's legal shooting time. Uh, it's a half hour before sunrise, and, and uh, pretty soon we ought to see some deer, or maybe not. You know, that, maybe that doe that attracted that buck to this area was an in estrus, or, you know, that's possible. Uh, or, you know, if he was dragging his feet from track to track of snow, she was an estrus. No doubt about it, that doe is an estrus. He, he's dragging his feet. Whether he's with her or not, maybe just tracks of the buck himself, forest tracks, and he's dragging his feet to, from track to track. Well, he is smelling the pheromone being produced by that doe being emitted into the air. and that, when he smells that and she's close, he's dragging his feet from track to track. That's one of the effects that pheromone has on that big buck. He's going to be here in this area. Uh, later today, tomorrow morning, or he's there right now. You know, you're going out there early in the morning, and here's his tracks in the snow, your flashlight beam, and, there, and he's with the other door. Or maybe he isn't with her, maybe he's just smelling and he's heading to where she is. So. But they're going to be in that feeding area at first light. That's where they're going to be. That doe doesn't care whether she's going to be bred soon or not. When it's time to eat, she's going to go eat. Yeah. And that buck is just going to wait around until she's done with them. And probably until they get back to her bedding area. But he's going to be there. That's where he's going to be. So anyway, you're going through all these procedures to make sure that buck doesn't know you're there. So now you're up there finally. We got through all those those uh, those ways of ruining your your hunt. Maybe for the whole season that can that can be. Jesus, maybe you only get one chance like this the whole hunting season. Don't wreck it by doing dumb things. Now, when you're in your stand, your job is to prevent being seen, heard, or smelled. Like that buck you'd like to get. Now, you're at a real disadvantage here. <laughs> Though, if you're well camouflaged, got good cover, your silhouette isn't obvious, things like that, um, and you're sitting very still, um, so the odds are about 10 to 1 that deer won't see you until you move. So what you, the way you move and when you move, things like that are really important. So uh, the odds are in favor of the buck at this point. Their, their eyes are terribly motion sensitive, much more motion sensitive. You can, all, things can, all kinds of things can be moving around you in the woods and you never even notice them. But they never, a big buck will see them all and he'll check them all. Sometimes you know, well, that's a squirrel. He sees the squirrel. Or what? What was that over there? I'm going to look at that for a while and try to figure out what it was. That kind of thing. So you're at a disadvantage there. Uh, sounds they have terribly good hearing. I don't know how much better their hearing is better than a human. Certainly better than mine. My hearing isn't so good anymore. At age 84. That's kind of normal for guys my age. But at any rate especially if you're you've been firing guns for all those years. Uh, uh, but they have much better hearing than we do. And their ability to to hear you works in all directions. They're 60 degrees. Long ways away. They 
on a quiet morning out in the woods, they can hear us like a, a rifle being cocked 200 yards away like nothing. And, I, and the experienced older bucks say, oh, geez, that's a metallic click. Dangerous over there. You don't want that. So they have the advantage when it comes to hearing. Now, like I said, their eyes aren't likely to see you if you're well camouflaged, whether you're blaze orange or, or not, like when you're going. Their motion sensitive eyes are so quick to see motions that they have the advantage there. So here we are, hearing and seeing, but smell. The smell is 100% in favor of a deer, uh, an experienced deer. You know, a young fawn or, a, or even a yearling might not realize you're a human when they smell you. But no problem for any whitetail that's two and a half years of age or older. They've survived. They, those are deer that have already survived two hunting seasons. They know the media. That's a human. So anyway, that's 100% in favor of them except for one thing. They can only smell things coming at them from upwind. You know? uh, if they go over there, crosswind, downwind, any direction like that, uh, they, don't, they can't smell you. <laughs> so you have the advantage there if you use it right. You now, if you're not foolish and say, oh, the wind is going toward my stand, but that's the only place I got to hunt, so I'm going to go there and maybe I'll be lucky and get there without a deer not get finding me. Well, when you get there, your wind is still blowing downwind toward where those tracks are or those other deer signs that tell you a big buck is, is spending time in this area. Today, <laughs> this 24 hours, he's here. And, uh, but if your wind's blowing toward that area, you might as well be pounding on a drum all the way to your deer stand because you're ruining him and you'll not see the buck and he won't come back there for a long time once he's got you pegged there. So you don't want that to happen. So you always approach from downwind or crosswind. You know, the wind's blowing this way, you're going across. Since going over that way and the deer, you're, you're expecting to see the buck over there, that's safe going that way. But you got to start that downwind or crosswind movement at least 200 yards away from your tree stand. you got to be quite a ways away because, you know, if you have to travel sideways or even downwind part of the way to get to uh, the spot 200 yards uh, upwind or crosswind of your tree stand, uh, unless you're 200 yards away, uh, the deer within that distance, especially if they're only 100, 100 yards away or so, they're going to smell you getting there and they're going to react to it. If they're 200 yards or more away and they smell you, they aren't going to react to it. They're just going to ignore you because they know that you're that far away and you're not moving in their direction so they're not worried about you. They'll just keep feeding. So 200 yards, that part's important. So you can practically eliminate the chance that the buck you want to get is going to ever smell you during a half day or a day you're, you're in that stand. But keep in mind too, all your scent's going to be going downwind. And on a day when the, when the wind is light, that scent is spreading out over a triangular area that gets wider and wider as it goes downwind. And 200 yards of wind, downwind, it can be 200 yards wide down there. It's just a little pointy thing right here. Now, all, most of your scents that come from your body, if not all of them, gradually drop to the ground. They spread actually through a big cone-shaped area going downwind and the bottom of the cone is going to touch the ground over there maybe 25 or 50 yards away. And at that point, the, the, your scent vector is narrow, small. And for this reason, sure, every hunter who spent time in the woods says, I, that deer came in for me from downwind and so I know it's they can't smell you when you're in a tree stand. Well, if your scent vector is still real normal, uh, or real narrow here, and it doesn't touch the ground for 25 to 50 yards downwind, then he comes from over that way. He never gets into your scent vector, and he's coming this way. Scent vector's getting wider and wider, but he's still outside of it. He can walk right up to your tree without smelling you. 
it can pass right under your tree, maybe out to 20 yards away even, not smell you because the scent is still over his head, even though, yeah, even from nine feet, it's over his head and he's going over that way. So, yeah, they can come at you from downwind I mean, to at certain angles at least and not smell you. But that's no proof they can't smell you from a tree stand. It just means they haven't gotten into that downwind scent factor. That's all it means. So you have to be careful about that. All right, so those are your jobs. To avoid being seen, heard, or smelled while you're in that tree. Now, a whole bunch of deer, we talked about this earlier, are going to be down one of you. Well, kinds of them are going to be moving around behind you. But maybe more than you see out in front. And they're going to smell you. And they won't react. You're a tree stander. It won't take them long, they'll stop and they'll be sniffing and that scent's not getting closer, or it's not getting stronger indicating you're coming toward them, and it's not getting weaker indicating you're going away, and it's not the source isn't going one way or the other way indicating you're walking this way or that way. So a person, they know you're not moving. And they stand there a little bit, and they, if you ever watch deer do this, they, you know, they'll sniff and they'll listen and watch and, try to figure out what, you know, what you're doing. And finally they'll say, well, that's a stand on here, all right. And nothing to worry about, as long as I keep 100 yards away from that spot. And they'll live life rather normally outside of a ring, a circle that size uh, around you. And so much of the time you never realize it happens until maybe you get down a street tree stand later and you go walking or going back to camp or your car and have lunch or something, uh, you find their tracks downwind. And you see where they've been stopped, where they stopped and they walked around and they moved a little bit this way and that way. And they were sizing you up and then they walked away. They didn't bound and run or anything like that. If they didn't bound or move rapidly trotting with their tracks spread out real far, uh, they're not going anywhere. They're going to stay home in their own home ranges. And they're going to be here tomorrow somewhere, <laughs> but not here. They're going to be somewhere else because they know you're here. Okay. So now, knowing that, the next, the, the two things you have to worry about most is being seen and heard. Well, the heard part should be easy. <laughs> After all, you're just sitting there. But if you're careless and you bump a foot on something and make a metallic sound or you open up a can of pop and go click and, uh, and it has a can of pop, you know, or you blow, start blowing real hard on your grunt call, which is not normal at all, or you start coughing or sneezing or making noises like that. Well, a sneeze sounds like a, like a, a deer snorting. And what does, it, what does that mean? A deer is... It's starting because there's something dangerous over there. <laughs> it's warning, a female, a doe is warning it's young. Or a big buck is warning this doe over here. There's something dangerous over there. I remember one time I got caught. I was just about, I was about 15 feet from a clump of spruces where I was planning to stand on it that morning. And it was still dark. And all of a sudden, Snort, snort, <laughs> damn doe was only about 20 yards from me on the left. And uh, it was snorting and snorting and snorting. And then pretty soon, a buck started grunting over here. He wasn't snorting, his real deep, deep chested, gurgling grunts, the damnedest grunts I ever heard in my life. And was, the buck was trying to tell the doe, Come over here, come over here. <laughs> he was planning to be with her, you know, and he's over here probably feeding when I walked in between them. And she smelled me and, oh my God, there's a human right there. Uh, he was trying to call, to tell her to come over here and she was trying to tell him, come with me, there's a dangerous human here. And finally they quit and the buck went off to the west and the doe went east and then north. And uh, I suppose they eventually got together. Obviously, she was in estrus at the time, you know. But uh, so anyway, 
But when you're in the tree stand and you know you got in there all safe, nothing wrong, it's quiet out there, and you're sitting here for a half hour, no sounds. There's no reason to even be moving during that hour for half hour. You're waiting for first light. You just sit real quiet, real still, relax. The rest of the time you're there, don't worry what's going on behind you. Those deer know you're there. You know they're doing the earth, and there's no way you're going to get one of those deer that walks past behind you because they know you're there. They see you turn around, boy, are they going to go and they're going to start, and then when they do that, they're going to ruin it because of the sounds they make and the, the ammonia-like odor that's pouring out of their uh, tarsal glands on their hind legs that they, that they emit when they are really excited, when they're terribly alarmed. They, they make that. And that just hangs around there for four days acting as a deer repellent. You don't want that. Just, it's kind of foolish to be moving around then. You can't shoot anything anyway, not until first life. So eliminate any chance of being spotted or heard during the half hour by doing nothing. Just sit quietly and be patient. And so then anyway, now it's getting to be first light. And then all of a sudden, holy cow, it's, it's legal shooting time half hour before sunrise. Now this is getting exciting. Now, I always keep my my rifle uh, on my lap with my thumbs, with my hands close to where I can go to, where I can push my that tang on my safety to the off position so I can be ready to fire. That takes hardly any more. No deer is going to see that one. I'm just sitting here like this and I push it over. Now it's ready to fire. Now I can now I have to worry about is getting my gun up without the deer seeing me. Now I'm watching that deer. Here he, here he comes. Here comes that buck. He's moving in my direction. That was a trail out there that I've been watching where all these tracks have been. Boy, he's been using this trail a lot. Or there's a, a, a brown scrape. He just, just renewed. He probably renewed that just an hour ago at the worm at the most. Geez. Black dirt all over the top of the snow, just scattered all over the place. Boy, that buck is close here. And he's with a doe. You know, it only happens in November and December when that buck, a dominant buck is with a doe and another buck is hanging around. And he, he's demonstrating to that buck, don't you dare come close any nearer here. You should get out of here because you know what's going to happen to you. He's furious. Yeah. He's kicking dirt way over there because he's mad because there's this other buck that's there. So now you know, now is there a doe and heat around here, but th that dominant breeding buck is here and that's his sign, and there's another buck around here. And it might be only a year, it might be the doe's own offspring, or it might be another bigger buck who's thinking, I, you know, I'd like to be the dominant breeding buck here now, and he might be a bit pretty big too. <laughs> so this is kind of exciting stuff going on out here in front of him. Okay, so anyway, that you got those here. So when you get your, when you think, you know, you're so anxious now, you think, should I just grab it and get ready and fire? You know, that big buck can make the damnedest leap you ever saw, or two of them. The minute he realizes there's a human there, uh, and and be gone in the middle of his second or third hop, leaping through evergreen trees or whatever, all kinds of cover, from then on all he sees is a little flash of a white tail and he's gone. And he's snorting. Oh, he's excited, boy. He, that scared the heck out of him. And so, you don't want that. The only time, sometimes, you know, I've had it where I'd sit there the whole time, couldn't move, and then he was gone, and I never even had a chance to get him. That's all right. Well, it isn't all right. It's, it's really, it, it makes you think for a long time, feel bad about having that happen, but it happens. But what you're doing is going to give you a lot more of those kind of opportunities than you'd have if you did any things any other way. It'd be a lot better for that buck to disappear without being shot at or without knowing you're there because chances are good maybe this afternoon. If that doe is still in that I'll get another chance this afternoon. Any other way, he's gone for the season. You know, if you do, if he was bounding away with his tail up, he's gone for the rest of the hunting season. You never get another chance at that buck. 
he better move good distance away and find another buck to hunt after that happens. So, anyway, you never do, never, your, your, your hands are on your gun, but don't move until that buck's head is hidden by cover. You can't see it, he's on the inside. Those evergreens are, then you can get it up and get it up to your shoulder and get ready to fire. Do you like that? And the gun is cocked, ready to fire. Now you're in business. He comes out from behind that. Or don't move if his head is pointing straight away. The only blind spot on that deer is when his head is pointing straight away. Because his eyes are kind of on the side where you can see 270 degrees around his body. So um, it's got to be pointed straight away or hidden by intervening cover. And then you're ready to go. But then it takes very little movement to get your gun in position and ready to fire. See? Oh, that's what you, that's the way you want it to happen. Now, let's say you're, you're, uh, maybe you're going to cock it silently. Let's say you're a bull hunter now, and you're at, you're at an angle here, and, but you expect to see the buck over there. And the reason you're at an angle is because when you come to a full draw, you want to be at an angle like you're standing in the gun range. You shoot sideways like you're, you're not standing facing the target. If you do that, you can't come to a full draw, and you won't get full penetration, you won't get an exit wound. That's terribly important. Like Sam, I'll talk about that later, but now you're at this, now you get a full draw. Stay all the way back here. Well, anyway, you're sitting at an angle like this. Same story. Um, you're, when you sat down and you're a bull owner, at least it was always my rule, I sit down, I hitch my mechanical release, it's got a band around my wrist here, mechanical release to the string, and the arrows in the arrow of my wrist goes down a little bit, and you move the arrow over, and, and it holds the arrow in uh, the rest area of the, of the ball. So it's, it's there, ready to go, except you got to push it down a little bit so it pops, it moves, you can move over, and it sits on top of the rest when you're ready to fire. So, But the arrow's already ready there. And, and your mechanical release is ready. And I always sit, uh, I always sat with my lower limb down there uh, on the platform. And I sit with the upper limb up here, and up in front, well, about that up, or up there, about like that. And I like it there because uh, the only movement you're going to make then that reduces the movement is to bring that upper limb a little higher while you're moving it over toward where the buck is. And then, like I said before, you don't want to go up here and have to draw your string like that, so like some people do when they got 90 pound pull, they, they think that's pretty macho. 60 is enough. Uh, and, and most I, I've shot through 500 pound bear, well, almost 500 pound bears, with 60 pound. And, and standard arrows with lots of foot-pounds pressure in them. But anyway, uh, you uh, you don't go up here and do that kind of You don't stand up. That's the worst darn thing. You stay right there in your seat, and your your draw is straight back. And you've been practicing that a lot, so all of a sudden the deer is looking right toward you. Not because he spotted something, or maybe he did, but it's looking in your direction, and you don't dare move now because it you don't have a clear shot yet, and you've got to be able to hold that for a little bit. You know? Okay, now he's flicked his tail and walked forward a little bit. Oh, he's heading toward that little opening. Now we're just about ready. Now, you did a lot of practice, and that's paying off right here. That's one another precaution a bow hunter should do. Get strong so you can pull that string straight back and hold it for a while. And all these muscles are strengthened by that. Now they're really tough. You could hold that for a long time. Yeah, no problem there. Okay, he's in open. Okay, <laughs> pull that little trigger back on your mechanical release. There goes the arrow. You're watching that that bright knock. I got bright green knock. You watch that disappear into the beer's body, deer's body, right where you aimed. Um, in this case, um, halfway down in the deer, see I'm nine feet up, halfway down in the deer, and it, it, now it's quartering away, that's the best thing, quartering away, and I shoot right behind the behind the rib, and the arrow's going to go through the, the lung on this side, the heart, 
there's going to be an X right through the heart, and it'll come out forward of the opposite shoulder, going through the other, other lung, and it exits. And you got a good blood trail. Boy, that's perfect. Everything's perfect. Got both lungs and heart. Now, whitetails can run 150 yards after being hit like that. So you want a blood trail. So you're not going to have trouble finding that deer after you've shot it. If you don't have a blood trail, it can be pretty tough. So I don't want that to happen. But anyway, these are, these are the procedures that you want. From. Okay, enough of that for now. Now, you want all that to happen? Well, like I said, your job is to prevent being heard. That should be easy, unless you're going to cough. One of these guys just really helps. Uh, <coughs> the hard part is avoid being seen in motions. Now, while you're sitting there, a lot of hunters, oh, they just can't stand seeing behind her. They're going to be turning around, looking over that way and that way and that way, moving much too fast. When you're a buck hunter, you don't do that. You forget that behind you. It's hopeless there anyway. So, could be a hundred deer back there, but you're not going to get one of them. Well, up here, this one of the deer you're going to get, especially over there where that buck had made all the signs. So, you're, you, if you're going to move, it's got to be slow, slow motion. You're going to move over to the left. Getting your eyes over here, you can look all the way over to the left and exit back that way even a little bit. And then you want to see the other way, well, you move slowly. And all the while your eyes might be moving all over the place, but slowly. And over to there. Uh, and you're gonna and you shouldn't be doing it all the time. You know, let's say you've done that, you've been sitting here for ten minutes, not a damn thing around here. Take a break from it. Take a break from standing. What I mean, don't do anything. You know, if you're laying against a tree, up in a tree, just put your head back or on the ground, boulder, tree trunk behind. You. Sit back or relax a little bit for a minute or so. That's that's kind of good. That makes it more comfortable. Okay, you took a break, and while you're relaxing, you know, now you're, you just got done scanning, and you're pretty certain there's nobody around here, no deer around here is going to see me. You know, get knees are getting a little bit achy, and arms, you can stretch your arms without doing a lot of work, just right here, like that, you know, keep close to your body. But your legs are something else, sometimes it just feels so good to be able to get them out in front of you, do it very slowly. And, oh, that feels so good. Oh, that feels good. After a while, and you're sitting in one way, too, your bottom starts getting a little sore, and, oh, this is just terrible. You can, well, rather than move forward like that, just ease to one side and put all your weight on one side like that. Okay, now you're good for a half hour or more without being sore. And then alternate, do the other side, and then from straight on even while you're there, take your time. Now if you're a bow hunter, keep that space between your legs, where your bow is, because you don't want to be doing any movements this way if you, unless you absolutely have to, when that buck is in sight. So, that's buck hunting. All the precaution you took was to make it possible for you had a chance to take a buck once you got to your stand site, whether on the ground or in a tree. And now you're doing things that what you have to do to make sure that buck doesn't realize you were near. And that's when you get the buck. So if he knows you're near, you might not even know he's near. It, more, I would say three times out of four, if that, that buck is going, to, is going to identify you without you even knowing it, and is going to leave before you even know it, and if you hunt in an area where there's snow on the ground, then maybe, and depending on which way he's going, you're going to see, oh, geez, there was a big buck right over here, and I never saw it. You see his tracks in the snow. And maybe it was with the doe and estrus, too, you know, and there's her tracks, too. And then, here comes some more tracks, another buck trailing, and they're leaving the area. All that can be happening without you even realizing it. 
and you didn't see them because you moved too much, too fast, and uh, and you made some kind of a noise that tipped them off. So, as long as you don't do that, then you're a buck hunter. Then you're going to see bucks. So, all those precautions you took, there's more to come. I'm going to talk about that next time, but all those precautions led up to this moment. We're at last. Look at the size of those antlers. <laughs> this is the most ex one of the most exciting moments in whitetail hunting. And you want to, you want this to happen. You dream of this all your life. Now at last, you know enough and how to how to make that happen much more regularly every year. Every year is going to happen, and that doesn't mean you're always going to get the buck every year. <laughs> like I say. Things favor the buck, and big bucks are lucky. They're so damn lucky. I was going to the biggest I ever saw about three years ago, got away from me because he was so damn lucky. Oh, he was a beauty, too. I, I haven't stopped thinking about that. My son John had that happen to him and quite a few years ago, about 15 years ago, and he's still thinking about it. So, anyway, that's, uh, that's going to be, that's part of buck hunting. But that's, it's such a, it's such a, a, a special thing, you know, to be a, a bona fide bucker, a guy who gets bucks like that every year, he's enjoying the very best bucker. And he's not hurting the deer population one iota. Uh, he's taking, only 10% of bucks get to breed, and then when one gets taken, one of those big dominant breeding but the next guy in line in the local buck pecking or the square mile pecking, he takes over. Oh, he's so lucky, you know. And some of those bucks do breeding anyway, because these older bucks generally draft their antlers just shortly before Christmas and before the deer migrate to their wintering areas. And once he loses antlers, he's all done with buck with breeding. He doesn't even want to breed. He doesn't even think about it. It can be three does in front of their nestress. No, he's not. He's all done with that for the year. But these other deer, oh, oh, oh boy. Gene and I once watched a little doe. That was an asterisk um, uh, uh, coming through the woods, and all of a sudden it started bounding away. I wonder, what is it? it never saw us. How, how come it's bounding like that? Pretty soon here come, I don't remember how many, it was like five bucks, all the antler, you know, and uh, right behind it, and they, they were all bounding after this poor little doe, and she probably wanted to breed, but. Having all those big guys coming at her like that probably scared the heck out of her. <laughs> and so that happens. But finally, at that point, some lesser antler bucks get to do the breeding. But um, anyway, I say that all the time. Don't I? Anyway, <laughs> this is it for today. Um, now, you've learned how to get to your stand, how to, what to do when you're in your stand. To take a big buck. All these kind of precautions. You said to count them up. That was a bunch of them. But you're not done yet. There's more precautions that are necessary at, at, for being a, a successful buck hunter. So that comes next. <laughs> so uh, that'll be part four, I believe. We'll, we'll make that part four. Uh, that's from stand back to camp or stand to uh, your car. So with that, thank you again for everybody for coming to, uh, for watching my videos, and thank you again for buying my books. I, I can't help but say that. Uh, it, it, it's just been such a great year for me, and that book is doing so well. So, uh, with that, wish you the best of luck in the future, and goodbye for now, and I'll see you again soon.